Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We will get started in just a few seconds. All right, so uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. Thank you so much for your interest in today's training. Uh, this is a Disability Rights Advocates Guide to the Federal Emergency Management Agency's Disaster Assistance Appeals Process. Uh, today's training is hosted by Pro Bono Net in partnership with the Legal Aid of Sonoma County and Disability Rights Texas. And it is for those currently assisting disaster survivors and for people who want to learn more about FEMA appeal process and preparation for a future disaster. We will also be covering uh, considerations on reasonable accommodations when it comes to FEMA disaster assistance. And I want to note that the general FEMA application and appeals process is federal, so it is consistent across all states and territories. Therefore, this training is tailored to a national audience. We also want to acknowledge um, the situations in many parts of the country where disasters are currently happening, including in Hawaii. And we do hope that this is a resource for those of you responding to these disasters. And um, if there are anything, uh, any resources that we can provide, please don't hesitate uh, to reach out to us. For our attendees today, please use the chat to share comments or resources with other attendees if you'd like to do that and please uh, use the Q&A function to ask questions. If you cannot access the Q&A function, uh, you can send us an email uh, directly to uh, jortiz at probono.net. We will go through the questions submitted via the Q&A at the end of the training. And when you ask your question, we just request that you please refer to the section of the training so that we know what your question is about at the end. We also want to make uh, today's materials accessible, so all of, uh, all of the materials of today's training will be up uploaded to the chat, so my colleague Sana uh, Malik will be uploading those uh, momentarily so that you can download them at your convenience. In addition, attendees can enable Zoom's webinar closed caption setting under the show captions icon for automated captions. And attendees uh, who would like to do that can also click on view full transcript in the closed caption settings for the full live transcription. This webinar uh, is being recorded and we will be posting the webinar materials, the training recording and a training transcript to the online library of the Advocate Network of Advocates for DisasterJustice.org. If you're a member of ABJ, all you need to do is log in and go to the link um, to access the materials. That's part of uh, our, our slide deck. And we will drop that in the chat as well. If you're not a member of ABJ, you can create a free account to access the library. And you can access these links in the presentation we've attached. And we'll also be following up with the post-webinar email, um, including, with, uh, including this information. For those not familiar with Pro Bono Net, uh, we're a national nonprofit based in New York City, and our mission is to bring the power of the law to all by building uh, cutting-edge digital tools and fostering collaborations with the nation's uh, leading civil legal organizations. We do our work through a variety of programs that reach millions of people every year, and we are proud to work with multiple organizations around the country that provide free legal services and self-help resources, including to people impacted by climate-driven disasters. And uh, we are uh, today's trainers. So my name is Jeannie Ortiz Ortiz. I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I use ella pronouns uh, in Spanish, which is my native language. And I am a senior program uh, manager at Pro Bono Net. I am in the early part of my 30s. I have dark brown, medium length hair. Uh, I'm wearing glasses today and a dark brown and black blouse. Uh, Kendall. Thank you, Jeannie. My name is Kendall Jarvis. I'm the lead disaster relief attorney with Legal Aid of Sonoma County. I also use she, her pronouns. I am in my later 30s and I have brownish blonde hair, but it is up today. And I'm wearing a black blazer. Steph? Hi, you guys. My name is Stephanie Duke. I am the supervising attorney and disaster resilience coordinator at Disability Rights Texas. I am a tall, slender, Caucasian, middle-aged female with actually a buzzed cut now with, but it's still salt and pepper gray hair. 
And I am reporting to you from my home office, just north of Houston, Texas, and wearing a actual bright red shirt today. Great. Thank you, Stephanie and Kendall. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna uh, provide brief uh, information about these next slides. So all the materials that we'll talk about will be posted to this uh, ADJ website. ADJ is a collaboration of several organizations and has grown into the largest national network of uh, 800 and plus justice advocates and allies working with communities impacted by climate driven disasters. So we encourage you to check out all the materials posted there. Um, also for anything related to FEMA and their appeal process, you can refer to these slides, which list the Stafford Act, the Individual Assistance Program and Policy Guide and important changes from last year to the application and appeals process with FEMA. And I'll wrap up uh, my section and welcome remarks uh, by sharing that our final training will take place uh, next month and we'll cover the general FEMA appeal process. It's very similar to the training that we hosted in June. It will be in English and we'll have uh, Spanish simultaneous interpretation available because the FEMA appeal letter online program that we'll talk about um, today is also available in Spanish. And I'll be dropping the link in the chat where you can find uh, information on the upcoming training. Um, and just for those of you um, who can benefit from, from this in Spanish, si usted no acompaña hoy, agradecemos mucho su interés en este programa. Eh, si tenemos un, un programa el próximo eh, mes donde podremos, eh, vamos a facilitar el programa eh, en español y yo incluiré el enlace en el chat para esos que le interese eh, registrarse. All right, so uh, next I'll tender over to Kendall. Kendall. Thank you, Jeannie. So as I said, my name is Kendall Jarvis and as part of the work that I do with Legal Aid of Sonoma County, we started the disaster relief program in 2017 after the Sonoma complex fires and I've been doing this work ever since. So part of what we do is respond to disasters and help other communities respond to disasters. And FEMA, unfortunately or positively, is a consistent issue that arises across jurisdictions. Next slide, please. So FEMA itself is obviously, as you guys know, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, right? The real reason that FEMA is, is an issue from a legal standpoint is because there are certain programs that can help individual survivors in and after a disaster. So FEMA can come in and help with things like response, which is pretty standard. But when there's an actual individual assistance declaration, that's really the purpose of what we're talking about today. And an individual assistance declaration basically opens up grant and loan funding programs to help individual survivors repair, replace personal and real property. Next slide, please. And as I said, there are a number of other programs for our purposes today, we're gonna to keep it to the main programs that are related to an individual's assistance program declaration. So, the first program that people get put into once they registered is called the Individuals and Households Program or IHP. That program is really designed to help with essential personal property needs, essential business property needs, and or temporary housing support. The SBA program is the second program that people will get pushed into. That's a small business administration loan program. And that's often confusing to people, one, because it's called small business, it's not just for businesses, it is also for individuals. However, it is a loan program, so people often think, well, I, I, I can't afford a loan or I might not qualify for a loan. So one thing to note, and I will probably say this again, is that it is important to go through that process because if you go through the SBA process, you may then get kicked to the third program, which is the Other Needs Assistance Program or ONA. That's an additional grant program that's designed to help with the same thing as the IHP pro program from the, from the perspective of the sort of goal of helping the survivor recover. However, it's, it, as I said, a grant program, and it's a little bit broader than the IHP program is, that it is really, IHP is kind of designed to be more narrow and focused predominantly on temporary housing support. Next slide, please. So now I'm turning it over to Steph. 
Thanks, Kendall, Stephanie. So I'm gonna uh, address meaningful access, kind of the reason why we're here today. Uh, the standard for meaningful access evolved from Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and it's a prohibition against discrimination on the basis of national origin. Since then, it has been strengthened by other federal laws and non-discriminatory obligations for protected classes to align with equal protection under the 14th Amendment. And there's a chart on this page that lists all the protected classes. So we look at race, religion or creed, national origin, age, disability, veteran status, genetic information, citizenship, and then sex, which also includes gender, pregnancy, sexual orientation, and gender identity. So next slide. Specifically to four individuals with disabilities under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, as applied to FEMA, because FEMA is a federal agency, FEMA has a duty to operate each service program or activity so that the service program or activity, when viewed in its entirety, is readily accessible to and usable by individuals with disabilities. So that means people will also, they need to be afforded the opportunity to participate in and benefit from. So when you're talking about meaningful access, access must exist both architecturally and programmatically to afford that meaningful access. So architecturally, you're talking about, you know, accessing physical locations. And then programmatically, we're talking about policies, procedures, and practices. So when thinking about programs, right, it's not just about getting to the building that houses the program. Like if you're looking at ramps or curb cuts to allow that physical access, it's also ensuring that what's in that building is accessible and that we would provide the right accommodation, support, and services to ensure that all people have the ability to participate in and benefit from. Next slide. Okay, and I uh, turn it back yeah. over to me. Thanks <laughs> yes. to you. <laughs> so next we're gonna talk about appealing FEMA's disaster assistance decisions and really some tips and tricks and how we can kind of help build confidence to make sure that everyone feels like they can and have access to appealing a FEMA decision. Next slide, please. So first, it's super common to have to appeal a FEMA decision. It, it, there are some sort of structural issues within FEMA that kind of lead to the need to appeal. Some of them are relatively simplistic, like for example, um, after a, a, a disaster occurs, a lot of people don't have documentation on them to demonstrate that they actually lost or were evacuated from or had damage to their place of primary residency, right? They don't think to come and, and take their lease as they're fleeing for their life, right? The same is true if you have insurance. That's an automatic, basically, lack of eligibility until you can come back and establish that yeah, I have insurance, but it actually isn't really great insurance and I have all these additional outstanding unmet needs. So I just wanna highlight the fact that it's super, super common to have to appeal FEMA decisions. Sometimes it's common to have to appeal them many times and we'll talk about some of the reasons for that in just a moment. Next slide, please. So who can submit a FEMA appeal? This is super important because I will say when I started this work, there was this video that they had us watch and it was like, you must be an attorney. This must be full representation. You know, you have to handle the case from top to bottom. The truth is that's not true at all. It, that's not accurate. We would actually like to build community resilience in a way that we are discounting the fact that you have to be an attorney. However, if you are an attorney, that's great. And it's a great opportunity to be able to help people in, in a wide variety of areas, right? throughout our country. So I encourage all kinds of that. But to be specific, first, obviously the applicant, the survivor, the person that registered with FEMA, they can submit that appeal. Secondarily, as I said, if you're an attorney, it's super helpful to be present because it's sometimes easier to make those arguments, especially when the survivor is overwhelmed. And the third thing is that somebody else can. So it, we have something called 
um, disaster case managers, and they generally come after an IA declaration, individual assistance declaration, uh, as part of the FEMA contract process with the local impacted community, right? Those disaster case managers are super, super helpful in being able to gather documents. You know, they have significant contact with the survivor themselves for a variety of reasons. So they can really help work through the process. They can even help you work through the process, right? So I encourage people to view this broadly, whether it is the applicant themselves, an attorney, a friend, a family member, a volunteer, a paralegal, a disaster case manager. I think that the idea is if we can build that resiliency ahead of time, then our community is that much better off. Next slide, please. So how can you help with a FEMA appeal? So the first thing is realistically, survivors are super overwhelmed. Not only have they often lost everything, they're also displaced and they have just gone through a very significant trauma. So even if they want to appeal on their own, it can sometimes be really difficult to do that. They might not be able to navigate the process is easily as they would had they not gone through this experience. So it's super helpful even to do sort of the small things like help people compile documents, help identify how to find those documents, right? And also they're, they're in a disaster setting, we really lose things like power, internet, obviously very few people bring their laptop or their computer. So they may only have like their smartphone if they thought to bring it in, if they were fortunate enough to have one, right? So they, there's another very simple way to help, which is to really just be there, be available to print the appeals, copy documents, put the paperwork together. So the, the package that they have to submit for the appeal can be very clean and clear and presented efficiently. Next slide, please. So common reasons for denials. This, I mean, there are many reasons that FEMA can deny. So this is not exhausted by any means. But as we were just saying, if the applicant has insurance coverage, they basically are automatically deemed ineligible. And the letter that is received from FEMA basically tells you that you're not eligible. So this is sort of an obstacle, something that I know FEMA is working on. We're trying to change that language a bit. Um, from a CBO standpoint, giving FEMA that insight of how it impacts people on the ground. But the reality is when you hear the term ineligible, you generally don't think that means you could suddenly become eligible by appealing. However, in this situation, that's actually incorrect and you can. So if you have insurance coverage of any kind, it, it's most likely that FEMA is going to say, okay, well, you don't have any outstanding unmet needs. Your insurance should cover that. So they will send you a, re a rejection letter that basically says you're not eligible. Super important to appeal that, assuming that you still have outstanding unmet needs that are not covered by another source, right? That's really what FEMA is designed to help with. Secondarily, most of the time, as I said, applicants really don't have all the documentation that they need. I mean, from simplistic things like I didn't think to bring my lease, so I can't prove that I lived here, right? to more complicated things like I am lawfully in the United States. I have a green card, but my documentation is at my house and my house is gone. So documentation, I can't stress enough how important that is. And it is, is a very consistent reason to have to appeal. And I think people, survivors get very overwhelmed because they don't know how to gather it. So this is a, a great place to start from when you're trying to help someone think, okay, what documentation do we have that we can demonstrate really the reasons to support our appeal, right? And then the other issues that come up are if, if applicants receive benefits from another source. So FEMA cannot duplicate benefits. That's super important to note. So sometimes people will get benefits from like um, Salvation Army or the Red Cross and it's for housing temporarily. So the important thing here is to highlight the fact that those benefits are not long-standing, right? They're, they're short-term benefits. Like, uh, for example, we know that people in Maui right now <clears throat> have been put in um, hotels or motels by like local churches, but the church says, I'm only going to do this for two weeks. 
So you need to be really sort of aware of when that ends, and then FEMA should be able to pick up the slack. And then the primary residency issue is significant. A lot of times, especially in places where that are more rural or you have multi-generational households coming together, it's very it can be very difficult to prove primary ownership or occupancy. So maybe you inherited the home, but nobody actually went through probate. So title was never changed. Title says it still belongs to great grandma who's no longer with us, unfortunately. And that's something that has to be corrected. And there are a bunch of trainings on this. So if you have significant questions about that, feel free to reach out. Next slide, please. So this is an issue that we wanted to highlight because it's super important. People that are undocumented feel that they do not qualify for FEMA. In theory, that is true from an individual standpoint. However, really what FEMA is looking at is the household itself. So as long as you have someone in the household who is lawfully in the United States, that household can qualify for FEMA support. You do have to provide information about the other people in the household, so and basically their status. So we have never seen FEMA use or share that information to someone's detriment, but it is a question that you, you want to have a meaningful conversation with the survivor about. It, need, it needs to be very deliberate that their household needs this support. There is at least someone in the household that's lawfully in the United States, and they are going to trust that the system is going to work. Next slide, please. So what do you include in your FEMA appeal? Tons of things, but really most importantly, the FEMA website always has very clear instructions. You must include the name of the survivor slash applicant, the date of birth, the disaster number, the FEMA registration number, the date, the applicant's current mailing address and phone number and the address of the lost property. And the mailing address piece I wanna highlight because oftentimes survivors have to move multiple times and they are no longer able to get mail at their loss address. So it can be a good idea to set up a PO box, for example, but not everyone does that. So if you are moving consistently, you wanna make sure that FEMA is aware of where you are currently so that they can actually engage with you. Otherwise, they're gonna send letters to a place that you're not gonna get. Um, the second thing is that really it doesn't need to be long and convoluted. It can be very short, very direct, and very clear. It's like I'm writing today to appeal this decision because I believe that I should be eligible for the following reasons, and I am in need of X unmet need that FEMA can cover, such as replacement of real or personal property, business property, or temporary housing support, right? And then realistically, you want to include documentation and why you're providing that documentation. Sometimes we assume someone's going to know what the documentation means. Like if you send in an, a, a copy of your insurance declaration page, and then an explanation of the fact that your personal property needs far exceed that, right? Or your temporary housing needs far exceed that coverage. It, it's very good to just simplistically state that outright, like this documentation is to prove X. Next slide, please. So as I said, helping with FEMA appeals is super, super important. Really, I think almost anyone can do it, even though I'm an attorney and some attorneys would disagree with me. Um, <laughs> I do really think that it is much less intimidating than we are sort of trained to think of. Dealing with the federal government is always kind of stressful. So there's this you know, question of, can I do this? Am I doing it right? And most people don't know enough about FEMA ahead of time. So there is this, this sense of, am I doing this right? What, how do I know if I am? You know, that, those kinds of things. So I really want to encourage you to just move through the process. It is something that it's, it, I promise you, it can be very, very simplistic, like what I refer to as law school 101. 
what is your best argument that you can make in the appeal? And what is the best documentation that you can provide to support that appeal? And really, sometimes we really just need to help applicants pull things together. So it, it, it can be difficult to try and navigate what it is that you're trying to appeal, right? FEMA says you're not eligible because you have insurance. Well, what does that mean? If you haven't been in that situation before, which hopefully most survivors have not had to be in a situation where they need FEMA more than once, there is this kind of pressure that is put on the applicant or survivor. So again, I'm just gonna highlight the documentation piece is huge and it's super, super helpful to help individuals just identify and even be creative. Like what is the best piece of documentation that I can get to support the reason for this appeal? And also something someone told me years ago that I have has been super, super helpful is call. It realistically, FEMA's helpline, if you call, you talk to someone, you say, what's really going on here? What does this individual need to provide to move forward in the process? And you would be surprised how many times that that really can just resolve the situation. And quite honestly, if you call and the person isn't helpful, in my opinion, it's okay to hang up and call back and hope you get someone more helpful. A lot of recovery, whether it's with insurance, FEMA, contractors, it's the luck of the draw. It's like the 50-50 toss of a coin. Sometimes you're gonna get someone that's super helpful, sometimes you're not. So it, it's worth it to call. It's also worth it to you know, know when you are not getting the help that you need and to call back. Next slide, please. So in terms of, well, there are a few things here. So first of all, you can request access to an applicant's complete FEMA file or what we call a FEMA file, right? That process can be done with a request for release of information. So the survivor can literally sign something that says, hey, Kendall has the right to review my entire file. The applicant themselves can say, hey, I want a copy of my file myself, right? But I also want to highlight here that FEMA has an online system at disasterassistance.gov. And that system is supposed to have basically all the correspondence that they have sent to the survivor and that the survivor has submitted to them. That can be a very sort of quick way to kind of see the trajectory and the timeline of what's really gone on in this appeal process since the point of registration and the need for appeal. So I encourage you to also don't just focus on trying to get the full file. I think you can get a, a very large amount of information by creating that online account. And you only need an email and password set up by the survivor. Next slide, please. Common mistakes. So this, there are obviously a lot of mistakes, right? FEMA's used to most of them. So they'll just send things back to you and say, okay, you know, that that documentation wasn't actually what we needed. We needed something different, right? But I will say that timing is a very important thing. Generally, you have 60 days from the date of the FEMA declaration to apply for FEMA assistance. Oftentimes that gets uh, pushed out further. So there'll be another 30 days allowed or another 60 days allowed, but paying attention to those timelines is super important. And the same is true with the appeal. So in theory, you have 60 days from the date of a denial letter to appeal for IHP or ONA and longer for the SBA program because they set their own standards there, which is generally about six months. However, sometimes you're gonna run into survivors that have not received the letter for reasons that I've mentioned and or that are too overwhelmed or can't identify the documentation. But I also want to say that it's important to know that you can request an extension or sort of a, a reprieve if you, you know, apply at day 67, if that's when you submit your appeal, you can say, hey, I have good cause for submitting my appeal late and this is what it is. In my opinion, almost anyone in that situation has good cause because they're traumatized. They don't have easy access to documentation. So I think all of those are very valid reasons to just include and an attempt to appeal. But there are also, if there's an additional reason, and I think Steph will talk about this a little bit too, 
especially if it's related to an access or functional needs issue that was not identified. Like we will see people getting um, all their FEMA correspondence in English when they clearly have said that their first language is actually Spanish. So that presents an additional hurdle or obstacle that they shouldn't have that's gonna take additional time. So keep that in mind. If it seems unreasonable, if it seems like there's a reason for repeal, just use the good cause element and that really should help. Next slide, please. Common mistakes. So the title and proof of primary residency thing is very, very common, unfortunately. Proof of primary residency is an issue because FEMA really is there to support people who lost or damaged the place that they were actually living in at the time, right? It's not meant for like vacation homes or secondary residences. Like in theory, that's FEMA tries to help those who would be most vulnerable in a given situation. So we see that being an issue if you're a renter for the obvious reason that you don't have your lease agreement. We see a lot of people that are, um, they had a great relationship with their landlord prior to the disaster, but when the disaster hit, maybe the landlord wasn't actually admitting that they were receiving this income as rental income, and now they don't wanna go on record of identifying themselves as a landlord in that situation. I can say that the rules of proof of primary residency have changed. So FEMA is allowed for basically additional documentation. So you can provide things like a copy of your utility bill, right? Um, you can, a, a letter from your postman or post person. It says, hey, yeah, Kendall's lived here for the past 10 years, right? a letter from your city councilman or your county supervisor or the equivalent in your area. Um, those are things that can really be helpful. And when you're down to the wire, <clears throat> it really helps to just do the best you can. So if you have a neighbor or a friend that's come over, they know that you've lived there, they can say, hey, I know that Kendall has lived here for the past 10 years, right? All of those things collectively can be helpful. So really you know know that it's expansive in terms of what can be covered but also be creative with the documentation when you can't get access to that right next slide please and kendall i do apologize um we were running a little bit behind so uh, we'll just need to wrap up this section fair enough so after the appeal is filed basically fema has to respond to you in writing which is important they might again deny they might ask for further information here i think that the real important thing is you want to continuously appeal if there are reasons or avenues that you can appeal next slide i'm going to skip this one because i know steph is talking about it there's going to be a bunch of changes that you will discuss that really help in the disability slash afn situation so over to you steph Thanks, Kendall. So let's talk about FEMA has done some updates. Um, one, because of the Disaster Recovery Reform Act of 2018, DRRA. It's an amendment to the Stafford Act, but basically it eliminates line item expenses for accessibility from reaching the max cap because IHP, Individual Housing Assistance, and then also ONA is capped at a certain amount max grant, right? Right now it's at 41,000 and it's adjusted annually based on inflation. So anything that goes to accessibility is not counted towards that cap, right? Because that deals with accessibility issues. Next slide, Jeannie. So the IAPPG, which is the Individual Assistance Program and Policy Guide explains those different things. When you talk about accessibility, items related to real property, we're talking about things that are fixed to the property, right? Ramps, um, even roads or whatever it may need to be for egress in and out of the home. And then specific things for personal property, we're talking about any devices, equipment, or supports that may be needed that that individual utilizes within the house home. Um, so those, that, those things cannot, if you are awarded, right, <laughs> eligibility, um, for FEMA, those types of things that need repair or replacement do not count towards that max cap of FEMA's programs. Not to say that it's going to happen, but sometimes you have to keep people in check, right? And in looking at those award amounts. 
Also in the IAPPG, they have expanded the critical needs assistance, which gives people access to temporary sheltering operations or TSA, sorry, if that becomes operable for the incident or event um, and making sure that those things, right? Because a lot of times those are operated at a motels or hotels that that actual residence or housing is accessible to a disaster survivor with a disability. Next slide, Jeannie. Also with the updates, they've established a standard award of 550 for clean and removal assistance. Um, this kind of goes to a habitability standard. Um, and as Kendall mentioned, you know, there's certain things you have to meet for eligibility. One of the things is that your, your residence has to be deemed unsafe, unfit for occupancy, right? So a lot of times what we saw is denials is that the home was considered safe to occupy for someone with an underlying health conditions, environmental you know, hazards related to the disaster can make the home or residence uninhabitable for them, but there hasn't been a efficient way, and we'll talk about that in just a second, to make sure that that reasonable accommodation is granted. So um, the clean and remove assistance can help with that mold remediation if there's smoke damage and stuff like that for disaster survivors with disability. Again, all contingent if you are eligible to begin with, right? So these are things that can be appealed in that process. And as I mentioned, the habitability standard, now the IAPPG does allow for individuals with disabilities to document the disability that may impact that habitability determination. So next slide. Um, you know, FEMA does a lot of things, um, but today we're specifically focused on IHP, but I did want to mention that FEMA supports, you know, mass care services or disaster case management. Now, equitable access to all of those programs may not come under Section 504 because it may be administered by a state agency. So that's where the ADA Title II may come into play. But still, equitable access to those programs is also going to be contingent on reasonable accommodations being provided. But that's not specifically what we're talking about today. So specific today, when we're talking about FEMA's IHP program. The first part is the application part, right? FEMA has done a good job of getting things online, and we're still waiting for a uniform application between FEMA, SBA, and HUD, but being able to access that application process is kind of the architectural piece, right? Do they have the supports in place to allow an opportunity to complete the application? If, if it's you know, at a DRC, Disaster Recovery Center, if you have the right people in place to help individuals fill out, or is it in compliance with Section 508 of the Sec uh, Rehabilitation Act to ensure that that accessibility compliance is met? Um, effective communication and completing the application is huge, right? You could have language barriers and needed translation services, any type of sensory needs, in completing it as well as cognitive needs. So depending on the event and how FEMA is deployed and plays out is what you need to look at and ensuring access to the application process. Now, FEMA did do some updates in 2021 to the registration intake process and is tracking reasonable accommodation requests. But whether or not that request follows through all of FEMA programs is still to be determined. So Kendall did mention that, um, you know, FEMA gives good cause exception for meeting timelines. Well, I would say even a reasonable accommodation can go even one step further in granting an extended timeline. If you can create that nexus between <clears throat> why you couldn't complete the application in a timely manner, because there's always going to be things that are outliers and need to be accommodated. So it's proffering that evidence and making that connection in the appeal process specific to just meeting the timeline or getting the application process done. Now, policies and procedures, this is kind of where that creativity may need to come into play because we don't know until we experience it. You know, with the direct services I've provided, the habitability issue has been the biggest concern, right? Because that goes to eligibility. And if you are an individual with an underlying health condition that puts you at more substantial risk for those environmental disaster related hazards, you are going to need that additional rental or, you know, assistance because you can't stay in that residence because it's not safe. I've had people forced into homelessness and institutionalization because they didn't get that additional financial assistance because they couldn't stay in the home, right? 
So ensuring that we have a process and that we ask for that reasonable accommodation as a modification to FEMA's habitability standard will help people meet that eligibility, that threshold, right, to even getting FEMA assistance. So that's one of the big things. And that can happen through the inspection process. You know, with COVID, <clears throat> excuse me, we saw a lot of windshield inspections that people weren't actually going in to do it. So if you are advocating for someone, ensuring that that habitability standard is looked at for that individual to make sure it's habitable for them based on their disability. Um, transitional housing, I had mentioned that lack of accessibility if they're doing hotel or motel vouchers to make sure that those are accessible. Another thing is once they become eligible for individual housing assistance, and if you get rental assistance, FEMA has this permanent housing plan that must be addressed. And the, the point behind it is to get people back on their feet, right? Ensure that they have a plan for stable housing as well as working. Well, for some of my clients that don't work or have a mental health impairment, this process can exacerbate issues. So because you have people coming in reminding you, well, you don't have stable housing, what's your work gonna look like? So asking for reasonable accommodations, even reducing those amount of meetings, if the person can do or has done those requirements, but looking at what can truly benefit the disaster survivor with a disability, right? Um, the next thing is duplication of benefits. Like I said, FEMA has done a good job of updating the registration intake process to accommodate, but duplication of benefits issues are gonna come months, years down the line. So in ensuring you know, effective notice for that disaster survivor is also an appealable concern. Um, next slide. I know, um, you know, like Kendall was saying, as far as strategy for specifically disaster survivors with disabilities, you have to understand the functional limitations of that disability or impairment, right? And how are the barriers that they're experiencing in FEMA's programs and what to ask for. You have to create that nexus, nexus in the appeal letter to show the bar barrier encountered, right, discriminatory conduct and why they're being denied access to participate or benefit from that said service. Now, um, it, it doesn't take an attorney to do that, but sometimes understanding how all that happens and plays out, right? Like Kendall said, you just gotta keep calling till you get the right person, but documenting that need, right? And that barrier is critical to ensuring FEMA appeals look at what needs to be looked at. Additional advocacy avenues that you can do, FEMA has an Office of Disability Integration and Coordination. Um, they're at each region and they're also deployed. So in an event, make sure if you're not getting answers or getting support that you reach out to them. And that can also go through FEMA's local individual assistance branch, um, run it up the chain of command if you have to. FEMA also has Office of Equal Rights that you can file a complaint with. And depending on the program, like if ONA is operated under a state agency, sometimes it's a bifurcated system between IHP and FEMA, uh, ONA. The state agency would also afford um, fair hearing process, which ensures due process rights. So those are other mechanisms or procedures that may afford additional protections. And then, of course, there's always litigation, too, if you have those resources and means to do that. So bottom line is for FEMA appeals for disaster survivors with disabilities, understand the barrier and the limitations, you know, that are created because of the disability. And that's what you fight for to ensure they have an equitable opportunity to participate in first and then benefit from that sub program. Back to you, Jeannie. All right. Great. Thank you, Stephanie and Kendall, for walking us through all of that. So based on what Kendall and Stephanie shared, um, we have that foundation of, about what an appeal letter uh, can look like and the contents of a good FEMA appeal based on the applicant's um, situation. So uh, Pro Bono Net's free online program allows you to create that FEMA appeal letter. And you can think of this as a free uh, turbo tax program, that's the comparison we use, you enter information and then the program will create an appeal letter for you, complete with the pre-filled sections and the appropriate language required for the appeal that Kendall um, briefly talked about. 
And the program does not only um, save you time, but also ensures that your appeal contains the essential elements um, in the letter as required by FEMA. Um, this tool uh, has been used by thousands of survivors and advocates over the years. It's user-friendly, it's mobile-friendly, and, and has also been revised over time to include updates from FEMA, including um, uh, updates uh, provided by Disability Rights Texas to allow disaster survivors with, with disabilities to explicitly address their lack of meaningful access to FEMA's programs based on the agency's failure to provide a reasonable accommodation. We've included the links um, here on the screen. It's femaappeals.org. And we also have the Spanish version, femaappeals.org slash ES. So how does it work? The program follows a question format to gather information from the survivor or the advocate. And based on the responses to those questions, the program will then generate a letter that the person can revise, edit, and save to their device. And this is important because you can tailor the appeal letter to reflect the ap applicant's unique situation based on the damage caused by the disaster. And after that, um, the advocate or the survivor can print out and submit the letter to FEMA as a formal appeal. The program is free. Um, it eliminates any financial barriers that survivors may face. Um, all of the personal information is protected throughout the privacy and we, throughout the process, excuse me, and we do have a privacy policy that that um, people can review on the page as well. But the idea is um, that this is uh, an, an advocacy tool that makes it easier for people, um, either the advocate or a survivor to clearly articulate why they're requesting FEMA to reconsider its determination. It's important to note though, that um, this online program is not connected to FEMA. It's not a service provided by FEMA. It was developed in partnership with attorneys who are familiar with the FEMA appeals process and has been reviewed over time to reflect that. Um, and then the program does not interpret or analyze any of the information you enter. Uh, it's important that the person review the final letter before submitting it to FEMA. And, Finally, it does not file the, the appeal with FEMA on the person's behalf. Filing the appeal with FEMA is a separate process that you or the survivor um, are responsible for completing independently. Uh, you can share this as a resource. For example, if you're a legal aid organization and the applicant is not eligible for uh, your services, uh, you can direct the applicant to this program so that they can complete it on their own. Okay. So I'm gonna switch now to a live demonstration so you can see how the program works. Uh, so I'm gonna close out this slide uh, presentation and I'm gonna to go to femaappeals.org, FEMA which will take you to this page. We have uh, instructions here provided. Um, and if you scroll down to the page, there's a start letter button that I'm gonna click. And uh, I'm gonna provide this demonstration as a guest. So I'm gonna click the terms of use and I'll start, we call it the interview because it's, a, it's in a question format. And Kendall and Stephanie provided me with notes on a hypothetical scenario that, that we'll use. Uh, so for this demonstration, we're going to pretend that the applicant um, to FEMA in this scenario is Steve. Uh, so Steve wants to appeal FEMA's denial for individual assistance under the individual housing program. Um, as he will be forced into homelessness or institutionalization without any help. Uh, so Steve it, in this scenario is an individual with a disability and was not provided a reasonable accommodation, um, specifically a modification to a current policy to ensure that he has an equitable opportunity to uh, benefit from FEMA's programs. Um, so we can pretend that uh, Steve was denied FEMA assistance as the residence was deemed safe to occupy and FEMA's process did not afford a modification to the habitability policy as the reasonable accommodation to account for Steve's disability related needs um, and underlying health condition. And in evaluating the habitability of the residents for him and overall eligibility under FEMA's program. So therefore he was denied um, the opportunity to participate in FEMA's program. So I'm gonna click continue and we provide some uh, descriptive text about what the application online program will do, um, some requirements about the devices. And uh, let's just enter some uh, fake information here. 
So I'm going to enter Steve's uh, birth date. These are fields required by uh, FEMA. So let's pretend that Steve is from Houston, um, Texas. And then there's additional information that the person can enter. And I'm going to enter just test um, fields here. This is where you would enter the pre-disaster address if it's different from the current address. And the information required by FEMA, which is FEMA's disaster number, FEMA's application number, which is a nine digit number. Let's pretend that the date of eligibility um, notification letter is from August 11th of this year. Steve was not awarded any money. So we're gonna put zero in this field. And then what the awarded assistance was supposed to cover, uh, we're gonna enter, it was rental assistance for the, um, for the renter, the applicant. For uh, reasons given by FEMA for denying or reducing the applicant's claim, we're gonna enter the residence was deemed safe to occupy, fit and sanitary. So that, will, that was uh, FEMA's reason for denying Steve the assistance. And then this is where you would enter the reasons that the attorney, advocate, or survivor believes that the decision was wrong. So I'm going to um, check here and just enter a brief uh, explanation on why the decision was wrong. And Stephanie provided that as an example when she talked about um, reasonable accommodations. And you can enter also click on this button to expand and see the window become uh, larger. And there is a checkbox uh, that says that I am an individual with a disability and was not provided with that disability accommodation. So that'll trigger additional um, sections of the program that you'll have to complete if, if that's the, the scenario. Um, and then it'll, these, these are the updates that we made um, uh, a few months ago uh, where you can check one of more of the applicable um, if you're an individual with a, a, a disability. So I'm gonna check here that Steve had an underlying health condition and was not provided that modification to FEMA's habitability standard. I'm gonna click continue. And this is the part where you would describe visits, conversations and correspondence with, uh, with FEMA that the survivor or, or the advocate or attorney had with FEMA. And I'm gonna click continue. This section requires the person to enter, uh, enter the documents in a list that the person will suppend, uh, excuse me, send in support of their appeal. So I'm gonna enter, enter that um, we're submitting medical documentation by Dr. Joe that offers evidence of an underlying um, health impairment. And this, this, uh, these lines will appear in that final letter when we click submit. Continue. These are the sections um, that will appear. So I'm going to click uh, disability related needs, click continue again. And again, this is it, information that, that we would have to enter based on those additional sections. So I'm going to click that the decision, the decision said my damages were insufficient, but the damage made by residents um, uninhabitable. This is the last step. You'll then be directed to a final page where you'll be able to click submit and the system will gather that information and generate a letter that you can download in Word format. You can edit it, you can save your answers, or you can email it to a third party, which can be a friend, an advocate, uh, someone who's helping you or, or uh, someone else or a family member. I've already pulled this up, so this is what it'll look like. The Word version will include information about the FEMA appeals process, instructions, um, the FEMA denial codes uh, for, um, for information and reference. And then this will be the appeal of denial of assistance with the information that the person, the user entered into the system. And you'll see that the for purposes of the demonstration, the, the sections that we uh, selected are included here as well. Then the last step is um, the person would need to sign a letter as it's generated and then submit it separately and independently with FEMA as an appeal. 
The last page is the request for information from FEMA files. So Kendall talked about this uh, briefly, but this is to request FEMA that they provide you with the documentation related to the applicant's um, uh, case, case with FEMA. All right, so that covers my demonstration. We have six minutes left for uh, questions. So why don't we go ahead and uh, cover those? I think when either Kendall, you or uh, Stephanie were, were talking, there was a question about um, what your experience has been alleging AFN in appeals. Um, well, I'll let Steph follow up with this, but I, in my experience, it kind of depends on what your request is. And I will say that FEMA's rules have changed to be more supportive of this process in the past five or so years. but. We've had like the example that was given here today, we had a situation in 2017 where there was a, a mobile home park that burned down, however, not the entire park. So there were 40 units that remained standing and everyone in those units was, except for one person, was above the age of 78. So we had all of these people that really didn't quote unquote lose their homes according to FEMA's determination because they were still standing but there was no heat, running water, electricity, right? We made that AFN argument. And I will say, I think that that's like what started FEMA down this path of seeing that um, they need to have a better handle on, like Steph was saying, what the, uh, the, the state or third-party contractors that they're working with, how they determine or deem if a house is habitable or not. So I think that that's improved a lot. We did eventually get FEMA support for all of those individuals, but it was challenging. Steph, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I would just say, like like mentioned earlier, FEMA has made some updates, but accessibility has been an issue for a long time with FEMA. Um, they're still not even collecting data to ensure equity on the back end. So even though we do have these registration intake reasonable accommodations that are being provided, right? Making sure that those follow through each program, because there's a lot of different stuff that a survivor can have access to once they're deemed eligible, that those are reinforced through the different programs, right? Whether it's ONA or um, the IHP stuff, whatever it is. But again, coming back to understanding that impact, right, that the disability or issue has on that individual, whether it's the habitability, effective communication, and advocating for that, either in an appeals process, right, formally, or with the boots on the ground and the other partners or stakeholders that may be involved in providing that programming. Great. Thanks, Kendall and Stephanie. And we did receive um, a question about if you would like to share any any of your thoughts on how community-based groups, uh, VOADs, voluntary organizations active in disaster, FEMA, and other groups responding to disasters to work together. Um, any thoughts around that? Yeah, so essentially the way that that process unfolds is there is a, a, a state VOAD, right? And then a local VOAD slash COAD, which is community organizations active in disasters. Once a disaster occurs, they pull in both the community organizations that already are part of that, or for a lot of communities, you don't actually have a very um, strong co-ad until your community needs one. So they'll also pull in community organizations at the time. Uh, there will also be state entities and federal entities that will participate. So there'll be like a FEMA regional director that will participate. Cal OES will participate and there'll be a regional director that is responsible for the territory in which that occurs. The local government, like the Office of Emergency Management on a, on a local jurisdiction basis will also participate. And then you'll have other community-based organizations that are standard to show up, right? Like the Red Cross, Catholic Charity, Salvation Army, sort of the national groups, right? And then there's the rest of us where if you're not always active in this work, you really do kind of have to make yourself known. I was actually just having this conversation with, with people in Maui that, you know, it's, it's really super important to learn about those meetings, learn who controls the agenda, right? Who sets up the, the details for the meetings, 
and make it known that you want to participate because the truth is is a legal service provider or you know an advocate for a community group that is vulnerable or really just needs support in that situation it's very very important that your voice is heard at the table i can't stress that enough i've helped set up a, a, a number of long term recovery groups over the years and that's eventually what comes out of a co-ad and it's very, very important to have a variety of voices to really convey on a governmental level what the issues are on the ground, right? Because not every disaster is the same, not every community is the same. Those issues are gonna change from one place to another. So I encourage people that if they are in a situation like that, really to participate, have your voice heard, share the knowledge that you glean on the ground. It is so important. Great. And with that, um, well, thanks so much, Kendall. Stephanie, any last words? No, just reiterate, you know, have the right people at the table. Don't ever assume you understand everybody else's lived experiences or barriers they may encounter. And then having that inclusive process and knowing, right, that awareness needs to be made, educating the community about those resources and doing it in blue sky times, right? Having those connections beforehand to make sure we're ready to help respond and recover. Wonderful. Absolutely. Well, I do want to thank uh, Stephanie and Kendall for joining us today. And thank you to all of our participants for taking the time to learn more about this. We have included our contact information here and in the materials. So please feel free to reach out with any questions or comments. There is a post webinar survey that will launch automatically once we end the webinar. We encourage your feedback. We appreciate your feedback. We take a look at every single comment. So please do take a minute to do that. And um, we'll be following up with the webinar as well with the links to the materials. Thank you so much, everyone. And we hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah.